Today I'm going to talk about working with patterns, equations, tables, and graphs. Now all this is sort of related in algebra, so it's important to sort of look at them together and see how they relate and whatnot. Uh, there'll be another video called arithmetic or arithmetic sequences, it will reference this video. So if you had watched that already and you're like, what video is he talking about? It's this one. So anyway, moving on, let's talk about the coordinate plane for a, a few minutes, uh, just as quite a, kind of a quick review. Now when I talk about the coordinate plane, I'm talking about a flat surface that has two dimensions, and we refer to those uh, dimensions in axis terms. So this is the x-axis, and this is the y. Everything on this uh, coordinate plane is uh, named or given location in reference to the point where the two axes cross. We refer to that point as the origin. And the value of the origin would be, and hopefully I don't use a gigantic red highlighter, and I don't know what happened there, um, 0, 0, that's the origin. So I'm going to pop a few points in here, there, here, here and here. It's irrelevant where I put them. Um, I'm also going to put one like right here. Why not? Um, I tend to label points in terms of where they are in relation to the origin in terms of, uh, and also in terms of what their x and y values are from that point. That's kind of how it ends up going. So what I'm going to end up doing here to find their values or their coordinate points as they say would be to see how far they are from the origin. So for this one 1, 2, 3 over, so I'm going to label the x component of my coordinate points as 3, and the y would be 1, 2, so I'm going to do 3 and 2. For this one, I'm this is positive x and this is negative, so it's negative 1, 2, 3, 4, and positive 1, 2, 3. The uh, down here would be negative 1, 2, and positive, or negative 1, 2 again, so it's negative 2, 2. And this last one, or the last one that's in the quadrant, it would be n positive 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and negative 1, 2, 3, 4. So 5 and negative 4. I also have situations where they're actually on the axis, and this would be 1, 2, 3, 4 on the y that's positive, and the x value doesn't go anywhere, so I say it's 0 and 4. Uh, as a representation of uh, giving me generic information about where a point is, I might list what quadrant that it's in. A quadrant uh, talks about these sections here where it breaks it into four parts, like the upper right part of a plus sign, that kind of thing. This is quadrant one. In quadrant one, your x and y's are always positive. In quadrant two, which is to the left here, so it's counterclockwise is the way we're going to go, this would be negative x's and positive y's. Uh, down here in quadrant three, you're looking at both the x's and the y's being negative. And in quadrant four, I don't know why my pen's sketching around, in quadrant four, you're looking at positive x's and negative y's. So all that's in play there. Oh, and also this point is not considered to be in a quadrant at all. It's on an axis. So there are some points that don't fall into either of those or any one of those determinations. The other thing I wanted to talk about in this uh, section is uh, the idea of independent versus dependent variables. In the real world, you don't tend to have uh, coordinate planes when you're doing data collection. So it tends to look a bit like this. You have the uh, what's essentially the first quadrant. It looks just like the first quadrant. In fact, it is. Um, in this situation, your x value most likely, and in almost every situation, uh, I can't imagine it not doing so, is um, your what's called your independent variable. It's the variable that would happen whether you're do, whether you do uh, whether you plan on doing or not. So if say I was taking data on fruit flies or whatever, the independent variable might be the number of hours or days from when I start my experiment. Those hours and days will pass whether I do measurements on the number of fruit flies or not. So it's considered to be an independent variable because it doesn't need anything. The dependent variable, however, uh, would be the y-axis. It has to have a reference point to make any sense whatsoever. So if I have this point on my graph, say this is uh, the number of days or whatever since or hours, whatever it happens to be, the dependent number here, this may be thousands of fruit flies, so one, two, three, four thousand, whatever it happens uh, to work out to become. So my y-value is four thousand or in this case it would be 4 because I'm assuming that you do a scale in uh, thousands, so I'm going to say the y value is 4, the x value is 2. 
two days or hours or whatever and 4,000 fruit flies. Um, but the 4,000 fruit flies doesn't mean anything unless I can connect it to the experiment, which would be that it takes two days. So I have 4,000 fruit flies. So what? Well, I had 4,000 in day two, and then in day three I had four. So that four total. That would be a whole other situation. And there's a giving me a reference point. So if it needs a reference point, it's dependent variable. If it is the reference point, it's the independent variable. And that's kind of how it all works. Also uh, important to deal with is scale. Uh, how you set these values is important. If I'm going to do, uh, you want to match it as closely as possible, if not exactly. So I'm going to say that these are 1, 2, 3, and 4. Well, these need to be 1, 2, 3, and 4 as well. But if I wanted to do, uh, since it's thousands of fruit flies, I need to label my axis as saying it's thousands. Otherwise, my graph is going to look insane. But if you don't keep a consistent scale from one place to the other, you really won't be able to get a look at what the graph itself actually looks like. You get no real information about it by drawing it without being able to see it, which is a problem. So that's all the stuff I wanted to talk about in terms of that. Let's talk about using the coordinate plane to make an equation. Now, when I do an equation on a coordinate plane, what I'm really looking at is a straight line. Uh, that means that no matter what x I punch in, I can get a corresponding y value that goes with it. The most generic way that they tend to look at, or we tend to look at uh, linear equations, which is where you have a straight line. So this case is a linear equation, which is what we're going to focus on today. We're going to use the slope-intercept form of y equals mx plus b. Now you've probably seen this about seven million times in your life, so it's not really that huge of a surprise. The m is slope, and the b is your intercept, or your y-intercept, I should say. Uh, slope here really represents change. It's a value that lets us know how I get from one point on the graph to another, like how I go from here to here. Well, it's important to know the slope to show how I get there. Uh, the y-intercept essentially represents a beginning. It's where everything starts out in terms of its relationship to the origin. Like we said, the origin is the key point uh, of any graphing situation. So I need to know like what this point is right here. That's important to me. Uh, so in order to figure out what the linear equation for this graph is, I need to find both parts of it. So it's easier to find the beginning, because I just go up my line, and you can see it's one up from the origin. So I'm going to make my equation here as y equals something x plus 1. If it started down here, I'd say minus 1. That's an important part. The other part is how much it changes. Now, when we're talking about the fruit fly time thing, the thing I'm most interested in, of course, is the number of fruit flies. Otherwise, why even bother doing the experiment in the first place? If I wanted to do an experiment about time, that would be the most boring thing I could ever imagine, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, so the thing that you think is important should set the uh, tone for your change mechanism. So I need to put my uh, y value or my dependent variable on top, and I'm going to divide it by the change in my x value. So really, it's change in y. Mm, I don't. I'm trying to do the change symbol here, but the thing is getting really sketchy on me. So I'm going to go from one point to the next. I'm going up one two. That's my change in y, and in the x, I'm going over 1. So 2 divided by 1 gives me 2. So I can say that my uh, experience here is that y is equal to 2x plus 1. So I have like a nice place to go. I can find out anything else I want from this information. If I want to know what the y value is when the x is 60, I would just plug in 60 where x is. And so y is equal to 20, 2 times 60 is 120, plus one more, 121. So I could say that there is a point one, uh, 60, 121 that exists on this line. And that's important to me because that represents a solution to the equation, which transitions right into this, or right into this. But we're going to get to there. There was one other point I wanted to make, uh, but I'll go back and make it because this is the logical uh, point to move on to. Um, so these set up, is 525 a solution for y equals x? And I'm just going to look to see if I plug in y, do I get the x value that it says I should get? So I'm going to write y is equal to 5x. My x would be the first one, of course. Twenty-five does equal twenty-five, so yeah, it is a solution. It probably falls somewhere right in here. On the other side, um, my x y here, my x is supposed to be negative twenty-five, and my y value to correspond is supposed to be negative five. 
So it says that negative 5 is equal to negative 125, which obviously it doesn't. So no, it's not a solution. Now that doesn't mean that negative 25, uh, negative 5 doesn't exist. It's just not on the line. It's probably somewhere way over in here, which is nowhere near the line that would go down here. So I can say it's not a solution. So I can look at solutions in terms of their algebraic sense as well as their graphical. Uh, so let's go back and cover this really fast because I did want to cover it. Uh, sometimes you'll see a graph that has dots and sometimes you'll see a graph that has points on it only. And I'm going to make the point graph here really quickly. Here. Here. Uh, whoa, what was that? It's doing some really weird jumpy thing today and it's driving me out of my mind. Okay, so uh, the difference here between dots and lines is whether the information is considered to be discrete, which would be the uh, dotted line thing or the dots, or whether it's continuous, and I want it to be orange to match. Um, uh, continuous information is I could plug in any x value I want and get a y value. So like that y equals 2x plus 1 thing, I could plug in a half for x and I'll still get a y that matches it. That's continuous information, every possibility. Discrete tends to match what we do in real life. When I buy something, if I buy a shirt and it's $20, I buy two shirts, those shirts, it's $40. Those points happen. I can't buy half a shirt or one sleeve or whatever. I have to buy the whole shirt. So there's no middle information. It's one shirt, two shirt. It's not like... Uh, half a shirt and a third of a shirt. That doesn't exist. So that's continuous versus discrete, just, you know, FYI. So from here, we're going to look at uh, combining all this together. Given some points, can we come up with a table of the data, maybe look at a graph about it, find out what's missing here, and then come up with an overall equation in whatever order we find. So the first thing I want to do is make a table. I like to make a table. It's I tend to look at things vertically as opposed to um, looking at them horizontally, which is what's here. So I'm going to make an x, y table. It would help if I would actually turn on the pen. That would be nice. So x and y, and if I get the right colors, man, things are standing in the way of this video. x and y. So 2 goes with 6, 4 goes with 12, 6 goes with 18. There's a glitch in that part of the board, I think. 8 and 24 and 10, and we have no idea. That's what we're looking for. So it'll look like this matching all the values together, that whole thing. Um, what I'm really looking at when I look at the table is change. So I need to see if there's a change in the y values and then the change in the x's. And there is a change and we're looking for it hopefully to be consistent. If it's consistent in the first time that I look at it, it's linear. So to go from 6 to 12 I need to add 6. From 12 to 18 I'm adding 6. From 18 to 24 I'm adding 6. On the other side, 2 to 4 is 2 change to go up I go to 2 and go up I go to 2. So that's good. The change on the right side or my dependent variable is the same as the change in my independent variable. That's important to me. It tells me that the graph looks linear. Visually it would look like this. I'm going to say that each one of these marks are 4. So 2 and 6 is somewhere like right in here. Um, 4 and 12 would be, whoa, that was weird. Like I said the pen's acting really weird today. Uh, 2 and 6 would be somewhere like right in here or actually it'd probably be closer to right over here. 4 and 12 would be 4, 8, 12, somewhere like right in here. And with that information, I can actually make a nice little line, which I'd rather do with the line maker as opposed to me trying to guess at it because it's disaster field. Well, it would have helped if I'd started in the right place, wouldn't it? So I'm going to try to go and make a line and hopefully not in the same color as everything else somewhere like right in here. That's the same color, but oh well. So I get this graph and it makes a nice linear relationship. Now I can use it to write my equation, which is the real issue here and the most important part. So in order to write my equation, I need to go over and do my uh, y equals mx plus b thing. Once I have this information, I need to find my beginning point. In order to find my beginning point, I need to look at what the uh, y value is when x is 0. Sort of like I need to find out what this point is. So I'm going to continue this pattern backwards to the 0 for x. Now if these go up by 2 every time, I just go back 2, which means it's one group away. I have to go this, this group the same distance, so it's 6, 6, 6, to down to the next 6, well, 6 minus 6 is 0, so it has a point at the origin. This is the key thing that I want. I want to know what the y value is because that's the y-intercept. That becomes my b value. 
plus 0. On the other side of it, I need to find the change. In order to do that, I need to look at how much my uh, dependent variable, my interesting variable, changes and divide it by the change in my, uh, ind uh, this is dependent, independent variable. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So it would be 3x, all that works out. Um, y equals 3x plus 0. Most of the time I won't write that 0 and it'll just be y equals 3x. I can test that if I want. Plug in, in x values like I plug in 2, uh, so 3 times 2 is 6. Well it says when I plug in 2 I get 6. If you do two times uh, 3 times 6 you get 18. Works out perfectly so it does match. Now I need to find the data for 10 whatever so I'm going to do y equals 3x and in this case I want to know when x is 10 y is equal to 30, so I can say that my match is 10 and 30. Works all the way up. Pretty simple stuff. I think we can do like two more and then we'll be done. I know it's getting long. So in this situation they want us to identify uh, the equation involved and then they want to identify the value of y when x is equal to 10. So I'm going to make my little uh, table here, my xy table. 1, 2, 3, 4, and the match would be 10 15, 20, and 25. Those are my matches. So I need to find my equation, so it's going to be based off the slope-intercept form. And it's kind of a mess, but it is what it is. Uh, my B value, of course, would be uh, where I have to go back, but let's look at the change part of it first this time. My change here would be 5, 5, and 5. They may go down, too, so you have to adjust for being negative. That's a possibility so you know. Because this could be, a I don't know why I put fives over here, it's one. They're going up by one, silly. So to find my change component, I need to find the change in my dependent variable divided by my independent. So five divided by one is five. So that's where I put as my m there. All I need to do now is find out what my starting point is. I need to go back one step to get to zero here. And for this one, I go back the same amount as I've been doing, which is five. So 10 minus five is five. That's my starting off point. So my, uh, my equation is y equals 5x plus 1. I can test it. Plug in 2. 2 times 5 is 10 plus 5 more. Gives me 15. Worked with 3 as well. So that's my equation. Now I need to find the value when x is equal to 18. I can do that, I think. In most situations, I'm capable of that. So I'm going to do y is equal to 5x plus 5. My x here is 18. So my y value matching out. 5 times 18 is 90, plus 5 more is 95, so I can say that I have 18 and 95. Simple stuff, one more and we are done. Uh, this same thing, basic setup is the same, so I'm going to do x and y, leave a little space this time, unlike last time. Uh, the matches are 7, or the corresponding values, 13, 19, and 25. Go up, done, done, done. Um, so I need to look for change. This is going up by 6. This is going up by 6. This is going up by 6. These are going by 3 every time. So to find my change component, I need to take the change in my y over my change in my x, and I come out with the whole change portion, or the slope, would be 2. So my y equals mx plus b thing here. My real equation is y equals 2x plus something. I just need to figure out what that plus something is. I need to drop this back to zero, so it's just one step because I've been going up by three every time. I need to go, uh, on this side I need to go by the same amount that it's been going, so I'm going to do uh, plus six, so one plus six gives me seven. That's the key there. Y equals 2x plus one. I can test it if I want. Plug in nine. Two times nine is 18, plus one more gives you 19, which would match. So there's that. Um, from here, what I'm going to do is find out what the 18 point is. So I'm going to look at y equals 2x plus 1 when, whoa, I don't know why it's following me everywhere today, plus 1 when y, when x is equal to 18, y is equal to 37 here. So I can say 18 and 37 
is a point. That's it. Take the information, make a table. Visually, you can use a graph if you like to. Uh, find your changes in y's and x's. Divide your change in y by your change in x. Uh, come up with your slope. And then come up with your uh, intercept by rotating that pattern back to where the x-axis is and or the y-axis is and finding what that intercept is. So uh, good luck.